a little while ago. He, uh, he remembered that I'd gone to uh, had a holiday in Japan and decided that I was going to talk about it. And uh, no matter what I said, how I wriggled, he insisted that I did so. Um, I'm not a great lover of people talking about their holidays, so what I've done is put a few shots together of uh, Japan, and I'll say a few words about it. But um, I'd like to take the opportunity to, uh, this lunchtime, of just giving you a little bit of background. The club very generously gave a £200 donation from the Christmas collection to uh, the Scout Group, which I happen to be uh, chairman, which is the first up to the Scout Group, um, in view of their 100 year celebrations. And I'll do a little bit more about that later if I may, and give you a little bit of a history. But just to deal with Japan first, a few, few pictures and a bit of thought about it. Um, if I can remember how this works, let's see what happens. It says help on this button. Right, here we go. Oh, uh, Japan. Uh, numbers of you have been to Japan, I suspect. I'm, I'm talking to people who, who know something about it, I expect. I know you've been everywhere. Um, but um, I think when, when I had my arm twisted to go to Japan, my wife thought it would be a good idea. Um, I was a bit hesitant because it's a, it's a 12 hour flight and, uh, you know, it's a bit of a pain. But um, nevertheless, I was persuaded. And she booked us into what is called a I suppose it's just an introduction to Japan, if you wish. A fortnight, really, whizzing around Japan, looking at as many things as you can and taking in as much as you can. And I find that very difficult because I can't remember names and I hope there's that sort of thing. But um, thoughts about Japan, it, I always think of much of our own country, some islands, you know, the other end of the world sort of thing. Um, but it is a very different place, I must confess. Um, I was surprised how much of it is, in fact, um, mountainous. It's quite a lot of the, the areas are actually mountainous. The, the main of agricultural areas are in the central valleys and around the coastal plain. And something like 70% of the population live around those areas. Of a population, I think you'll correct me, you, your son there at the moment is 127 million, I believe, isn't it? Oh, yeah. So uh, it's quite, it's well, you know, it's quite a lot larger than our own country. But um, the first thing you notice, the fir first thing I noticed was everything is small. I got on the coach when we got out at the airport, but it was small. Uh, there was, we couldn't put any luggage on. Normally, when they you get it, they shovel your luggage underneath and they cart you off to the hotel. Couldn't do that. No, no room for any luggage. You had to have a separate wagon to put luggage in. And when I got in the coach, it was four across of normal, very tight, very small seats. And there was the ability to drop a, a, a side thing down to make you could fill the middle up as well. So they could pack these coaches. In. And everything was, you know, rather small. Very small, aren't I? So what you blokes have got on, you big chaps, you difficult. But um, having said that, we stopped off in, t in Tokyo as our, our first place. Didn't spend long there. Um, just sort of got settled in for the first night. As I've been telling somebody, it put me off a bit because two of the boats on the, on the tour got mugged the first night in Japan. In, um, in Japan and they, they were, had their drinks spiked at a, a bar and then they returned over and had the shit knocked out of them until they gave their numbers for their cards and then they stripped their accounts out. Um, when, uh, when they eventually got back to the hotel, they were a terrible state. When they did get back, the police were summoned and they didn't accept that an incident had occurred. They don't, they don't have crime in, in Tokyo. <coughs> and they never actually got it recognised as a crime, which I thought was disgusting. There we are. So they did set the sea very well for us, so I was a bit cautious about Japan, but yeah. that was an unvery found fair image because from then on it was a wonderful trip, but the people were absolutely smashing. I can't believe something like And every hotel I stayed in, I think, in Japan, had a rotary club attached to Every, everyone I walked into had the rotary boat stuck at the back. Unfortunately, there wasn't time there to actually get into it at all, although one of the clubs was entertaining a group of Americans when I was there, and I did just have a brief word with one or two of them, but it's obviously very active rotary in, the, in that country. But I'll put a, further, a few pictures, um, in fact, I didn't do it in the last day, but for another thing, but I thought you might just have a little few pictures of Japan just to give you a feel of it. That, by the way, is Saki. Um, that uh, is, is a whole exhibition of, let's see if I get this thing to work. <coughs> I, this is the entrance to one of these temples, really. But I have all these, it's an advert, really, but it, it just amused me that I had all these bottles of hot tin spots on the way in. But they, they, they tell a story, I'm told. I can't remember who's over it. Just give you an idea what it's like. Well, we know the time. <laughs> So I thought that was you, Dennis, but it's not, you know. <laughs> um, this is the entrance to one of their, their temples. They're, they're two basic um, type. Buddhism is very out there, but they've got the original Shinto, is it called? Whatever. Um, the original religion, which um, revolves back to many, many years, when, of course, 
<coughs> they're very much in touch with the environment, and, uh, and that, that's how they think about it. Buddhism fits in nicely with that. But every, all the temples yeah. have these entrances, yeah. have these entrances, and um, thank you. And you can see the number of people, they're very popular. And as you go in, you have to uh, cleanse yourself, you see. You have to have a little wash, wash your hands. They're very keen on all this stuff, the Japanese, when you go into their temples. And uh, just as it happened as we were going into the temple, they were having a wedding. And uh, they covered the bride's head, we were told, to disguise the horns. I wasn't quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a, quite a that, that shot I took to the top of the tower in um, well they've got a, an Eiffel Tower type structure in the, the middle of Tokyo. I took the shot purely just because it interested me all around the place are these buildings, but in the middle, that in the centre is a graveyard. And they have them dotted all over the place. They just appear in the middle between buildings and they uh, it's really strange the way they don't uh, seem to be connected with the church and they just pop up. This is a typical sort of pagoda thing which uh, you find all over the place and uh, Many of them are not original, of course, they're reproductions because you've got to remember most of the Japanese cities were, um, can we say, removed by Ron Giggs and his people. Thank you. That's a, a technical entrance to one of the Buddhist streets. It's, uh, they're very impressive, very, very colourful. Uh, this chap appears in the garb measure. I can't say it's picture. That's the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo. Or it's his house, I would presume you call it. You can't get near to it, um, but that's where he lives. Um, well, set back as now as we can get. I thought I'd rather ask you a question. But, um, anybody know what that is? No Fuji. No Fuji. That's a wonderful shot, isn't it? Yeah. I didn't take it. Uh, <laughs> I, I stood for about th an hour waiting for the cloud to disappear from this wretched mountain. It was raining, and I thought, this is ridiculous. But on the wall was a lovely picture, so I thought, I'll cheat. <laughs> that is a fort. It's a, a, a timber fort, which is incredible. But you could actually go right up the top of that. and. Uh, it was, they have all the shutters that come down. It's supposed to be a, a fighting fort. I don't, somebody set lights, it wouldn't have done much good with it. But it's got a impressive building. Huh? <laughs> These shots are interesting only because we went to a, into a valley high up in the mountains where there is a village, um, it's a UNESCO, UNESCO site, and uh, they are they were good, they were living as they did in the old days. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, just one of the, anybody, anybody familiar with Japanese toilets? No. Because uh, you see the control panel on the right. As you, yeah. you sit down, there's a whole row of control panel there. You know about these, don't you? Uh, everywhere you go, these there, uh, public toilets everywhere. But don't touch anything, for Christ's sake. Yeah. <laughs> you just as likely to have things done to you that you really didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did manage to switch the heated seat on. And, uh, my life is jumped out of the skin with each other. There's all sorts of things you can do with it, but they're common practice. They're very keen on that sort of thing. I don't know if I... <laughs> 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 oh, this was just generally some... Uh, they have a lot of these parades and so forth, and they're very proud of their stuff they drag around. Which, oh, this is, oh, this is, this is the roof. They have about seven foot of snow on top of that roof, you know, in typical winter. Um, so they're, they're built... <laughs> They have to be constructed very well and lots of fashion on them. But um, it's all done with rope, no nails, as you can see. When you get up in the roof, I've got up in the other roof, so everything is, is lashed together. They don't use nails on any of this stuff. And they, they thatch them to massive depths, and they really are quite spectacular buildings. I don't know where they came from, they're very nice. They're not geisha girls. Um, we did actually see a real geisha girl, but they're, they're all done, they, they're white, they're very. Uh, at least this was a wedding, actually, once again, it was going on. Bride and groom. We believe you, Brian. Well, that's a typical. That's a typical Japanese girl. That was a. Um, and we went in. And there's a big pond full of lots of fish, and it was lovely. That's a typical way they build their garden. That was the village we went into. Uh, just about interesting really in the valley. So that is a typical entrance to a. a, a, a sacred air, I suppose you call it. That's an island, it's a holiday island off the coast of Japan where we went for the day. Um, and uh, it, that's the entrance to it. And all, all the religious places have these sort of 
wooden gates and structures. They're quite, they probably have great cities. That was, uh, I thought these were members of the club, you see, but I didn't recognise them. <laughs> Every entrance has two lines. One looking, one smiling and one not, and uh, on each side. That was the entrance to a Buddhist temple. I did actually go up there, I was knackered when I got there. What a funny one. Very, very impressive structures, buildings, uh, very interesting. These guys are all the museum. West Ham supporters, I saw them. <laughs> 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 They dress these guys up, they, they do a little small cover up, but they, they left, they have hundreds of these guys, I don't know, West Ham's cut up. What are they? Yeah, they little Buddhas, aren't they, little, you know, little oh, guys, okay. okay. like they weren't very talkative. <laughs> <laughs> Arsenal support was there. Now this is a bit more serious, this was, um, you, some of you recognise that, of course, that's the, the building where the A-bomb was exploded, you know, but, um, yeah, we spent a little bit over there, you know, uh, and it's quite, I've got to say, it's impressive. I mean, you, you read a lot of that, you see a lot of that. But when you actually stand there and see it, and that building is exactly the same condition as when the bomb went off. It's one of the only two structures left in Hiroshima that was there. This, oh, three, I'll tell you what. This one, there was a large concrete chimney stack which served the power station, which survived, and the bank. Because that was a concrete structure. So the only three buildings in the whole of Hiroshima that survived. And the bomb detonated directly above this structure which is presumably gave it some protection, but it's exactly as it was on the day it was um, back. It's beginning to fall down. I think we might have to all start restoring it a bit, but well, that gives you the details of it. But when you look at it, it's pretty awesome. That's a monument that the children um, erected in the park. It's a, it's a big park where it was situated. Um, lots of water, lots of stuff around. And that's the actual lake looking up to the museum. The museum, the massive museum, which is well worth looking at if you ever go there. Um, our hotel, just sort of put that in, because that's what their hotels are like. They, they incorporate them into shopping centres, and mm. yeah, they're immense mm. places. Hunting stories. Mm. All like that is, don't we? Yeah. What's that? Bullet train. Bullet train. <laughs> I had great difficulty getting a picture of a bullet train, because they didn't stop. <laughs> um, I did try very hard, but you see the gentleman standing there, um, he was in charge. When the train pulls up, it, it, you're given a carry, you're given a spot to stand for your carriage. There's a white line on it, you have to all line up. And he won't let you near the road. He stands there with his white gloves and stops it. And as soon as that train stops, it comes whizzing, stops, the doors open, the people get out, and you're early on, and the door shut, it's gone. If you if you if you blink, you're off the train, you don't get a shot. But that's the best shot I could get of one. It's um it's a very impressive uh, you think. Uh, that was a very large um place we got to. Um, didn't I recognise anybody in the evening? They're nice chaps, these, but they're all huge. Oh, this is what I thought would amuse you. They, they dress them all up. They dress up the, uh, these people. In case they get wet, I suppose. But it's, uh, it's obviously something they do. That, that was a rather interesting. I call it the Swiss uh, army knife, but it's uh, something you say. More ladies. I don't know if oh, That was a bride. Uh, that was a key What was that? Sorry? <laughs> that. Um, Oh, we were in, uh, what's the second city of, uh, what's the second city? Kyoto? <coughs> Kyoto. Yeah. Kyoto. Um, Kyoto. Which was far more impressive than um, in Tokyo. It's older, it's much more impressive. That's part of the uh, area where the ladies used to buy their business. <coughs> and these will interest some people. These, these guys nearly killed me, they don't know, but they, they, they roar about on these very posh motorcycles in pedestrian areas, which I thought was the Golden Temple, that really is worth seeing if you go to Germany. That, that is what it says. It's a gold, it's covered in gold. It's a golden <coughs> temple. Beautiful place. It really is fantastic. Um, that is the Emperor's Palace in uh, Kyoto. Um, that's as near as I get. He wouldn't let me in. Um, I didn't have a ticket, so they wouldn't let me in. But that's the wall around his palace. I could see it just in the distance, but I couldn't get any nearer to him, so I didn't visit. And that was actually where I took a Fuji from just before we came home when we were staying up in the mountains. It's uh, quite a um, of course, it's volcanic, it's active all the time around there. And we went up to see some of these um, areas where the water bubbles about happily. As you can see, lots of steam, lots of sulphur. And uh, that's a hard boiled egg, which I ate. Uh, it's, uh, you buy them, they chuck them in and cook them, but they come out black. Um, doesn't affect the inside, though. <laughs> oh, these were just some, that's Tokyo, just a shop as we were, were leaving, in fact. Um, oh, there's cruise ships in, I guess, there. 
that was a very brief whiz through for Japan. So it was an interesting holiday for me. There's some lovely stuff there. Yeah. 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 Well, you get the opportunity to go. So, um, so the, the Hiroshima one, I really, I did, did affect me a bit because it is quite. It's got a feel there. I don't know. It's, it has a sort of feeling there when you stand there. It's got. It does impact on you. The, and the children have their own area where they every year they desert, they build this stuff. It's, it really is very very good. In there. So what, that's all I want to do on Japan. I don't think much more. Until you go there yourself, you see. It. <laughs> All I really want is he was touched on the scouts um, today, if I may, because I say very generously talking about it with my committee. Um, and my president, I'm the group chairman of the, of the scouts over there, first up, so, so um, they were very grateful to receive your donation um, for the support of their 100 years. I thought it would be interesting. The group itself, um, it's, it's celebrate their 100th next year. Um, I thought just to touch on it briefly, if you, you'd all realise that scouting started in 1907. That's a turn. Uh, Baden Powell started it. Of course, he, you, you'd remember this, Dennis, better than I. Wasn't he a uh, general in the Great War? Is it the War? 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 Yeah. Yeah. That's where he got the idea from. Yeah, he was a general, but he got the idea from that. But he, but he, yeah. he certainly he formed the, he formed the scout. And his wife, I think, went on to form guiding right. a few years later, didn't she? So they were obviously the the backbone. I mean, if he did it now, he'd get locked up, wouldn't he? But, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a way of life, isn't it? But uh, yeah, obviously, so, um, just about which I thought you, you might you, you've heard me talk about grill crew, which is uh, he called as many of you've been there. I think you've seen it. Um, I'm often asked where the name came from, so I had to dig around and find out a bit. The name of Gwilku apparently um, derives from the G, which is uh, Gilwall, which is of course the main centre of scouting in this country. Um, Will, which was the Colonel Wilson, who was in fact the camp chief at that time of Gwilwall. And Ku comes from the uh, first patrol, which was uh, the scouts, which was the Kuku. So you have Gwilku. That's how the name originated. It's stuck since those days. Um, the group was started in May 1917 by uh, Mr. Thompson, who was uh, the founder and first scoutmaster. And the group at that time met in the vestry of the Congregational Church in Upminster. You, you know it now as the United Fort Church, I think where we hold our blood pressure checks and so forth. Uh, the flags of the group were officially presented to them um, in the grounds of Covent, the old Covent, Gout, Covent, uh, Covent Gardens, which of course was a, a big, much more than it is now uh, in Brookdale. Um, and uh, it was felt from the beginning that the group should be an interdominational group. And that's the only, uh, the, not only the first scout group in Atlas, as far as we know, the first interdominational group in the country. So in that, in that way, it's quite um, unique, we feel. Um, it worked to all, obviously being long gone, so we're up to all regions. We don't, you find a lot of churches where people go, it tends to be obviously Christian, Roman Catholic, whatever. But we, we have all sorts in that group. <laughs> yeah, I wonder about something. Um, <laughs> later, after they got settled in, they moved to um, an ex servicemen's club uh, hut, which had been erected in um, Corpus Tyro. Next, It's on the site of where the library, the new house, uh, the library stands. Um, and they were there for a number of years. Um, um, interestingly enough, I'll come back to them here, but that was where the new, that first contact, I think, with the New Zealanders took place during the, uh, the end of the Great War. Um, the land where the present day headquarters stands was purchased when the old estates, the big estates in Atlas, were built, being broken up in the late 1990s, uh, 1920 period. And they, they bought the ground um, in 1920. Um, which, as you all know, is now comes off Brookdale Avenue in Upminster. Um, some ten years later, they were in a position to purchase the hut, which the old timber hut, which obviously none of you remember. But an old timber building um, was bought and uh, started life initially as the, the rover den and the garage. Uh, the land cost two hundred and thirty pounds, uh, and the hut itself cost two hundred and fifty. So things have gone up in price. Um, and you've got to say, what, what far-sighted! people they were to actually do that as a committee. Um, and all that was organised by Mr Brumwin, who was then the mainstay of the group. Um, the chap then took over as group scout, a chap called Fred Halstrap, um, who joined the group in 1919, just after it had been formed. And he ran the group for many years as the group scout master, in fact, in 19, uh, from 1939 to 1961. And he was still the scout master, and I, in fact, um, uh, 
you know, just get asked to. Well, I joined as, as a lad. Um, very, very strong character, very nice guy. Got a bachelor all his life, lived with his sister in Brackendale, no, the one that's near the uh, windmill. He, he lived in one of those up there. And uh, he was a great supporter. He ran the group, basically, for <coughs> years. And even after he retired, when he's 90s, he used to still come up and see us. He was, he was a grand old boy. Um, and he, he, in fact, provided a lot of information, we, much as we can find, for the history of the group. Um, he was the main, I think, in 1909, toward the end of the Great War, they were using the hut in Corpus Tire Road um, for an a, a, a ward attached to the Great Towers, which was, of course, the mainstay at the end of the war of the New Zealand boys who came over and were injured. And they went into convalescence at Great Towers. And they used that area as a ward attached to it. And many of the rovers, or they were the senior scouts in the group in that time, actually did night service at the, um, on the ward. And many contacts were made, I understand, between them and the New Zealand lads. And those contacts were kept up for many, many years afterwards. And I can remember people coming over to see Fred uh, Halstrap from New Zealand uh, on several occasions. Uh, so that was something that lasted for a long while. Died out, of course, when, when he went and uh, people lost contact, but it was a well-established thing, and I think I mentioned it to um, when we were dealing with the recent uh, New Zealand celebrations. Um, exactly. They also apparently, according <coughs> to the records, did voluntary service with the fire service, because it was all voluntary in those days. They used to help man the fire engine. So God help us, I don't say, but, but, <laughs> the, but they, they, did, they did. That's the sort of thing that scouting were doing in those early, the early 20s. Uh, the group continued to develop, and in 1952, uh, oh, we, we built the Venture Den, as it's called, which is a, a, a brick structure which was built, um, and the, all, the, all the materials for building it were taken from the old convent stables when they were demolished prior to the development, you know, so, so most of that was that. Unfortunately, that got burnt down by vandals, and we had to build it up again in 1970, so that's been up and down a couple of times. In, um, we then had a... I'll mention it by name because you can work out how many uh, leaders we have. King Prentice, the chap who took over at that point as a group scout leader, um, despite difficult occasion by uh, lack of scouters, um, he was responsible for the planning really of what we got there. He took on the role of constructing the first two story brick extension to the old timber hut. Um, and he, he, did, he did wonders in getting the group, in keeping it going really. Um, he retired, he did 30 years with the, the group. Chap called Vin Don took over as group scouting. And Vin really, together with um, Ben Townsend, who was the old chairman and a great friend of mine, they actually saw the buildings constructed, the new timber, the new brick built structure, which is about twice the size of the original, containing all the toilet fertilizers, that sort of thing. They saw that through. Um, they, these guys had tremendous foresight and commitment. I mean, they used to get money grants and donors else. It was a really very interesting period for them um, working through there. And in fact, the made headquarters. Um, was the first two two-storey part went up in '67, and the main hall itself got built in, um, in 1971. So it's fairly, fairly recent stuff. Um, at that period, also, we we were strengthened considerably because there was a group meeting at Branfield School, which was called the Fifth Up Mr. Scout Group, which was struggling really for for accommodation and whatnot. And uh, they they joined forces with us, and they brought in a very, very strong. Um, very strong parent support group and, and also numbers and uh, it enabled the group to grow, to develop, to construct the huts that we now have and the facilities and it did very well indeed from that point on. Now that was officially opened uh, in 1976 by the then District Commissioner John Moore. But during the 70s uh, the group expanded its building and additional storage and camp storage facilities. Um, and also infill the area between the two dens to make uh, various things. Um, the land which we purchased was originally, well, nearly twice as big, I think, as what we've got now. It's one of those funny things in life where we started looking into where it had gone, but while we had such a small area, we found that they gave away about a third of the area of the land. We can't find any record of it being sold. It, it, it appears they gave it to, the, <laughs> to a chap at the bottom of the site who then developed it as an orchard. Um, uh, it was established for oh, years and years, like a huge row of um, uh, pile, what's it, the big poplar trees down one boundary, the west boundary. And he used to let us go in there to build the, the aerial runways, and they were horrendous things. I mean, he wouldn't let them do it now. But he used to have these aerial runways running out of the poplar trees onto the ground. 
Because we always used to have one up on the birthday party. Incredibly dangerous. Um, but as I say, in those days, <laughs> nobody seemed to bother about that sort of thing. Um, certainly most of us fell off it and didn't go out. So. But um, what ha what, why that ground was uh, given away, we, we have no idea. There's nothing in the records to indicate why. Um, great disappointment to us because uh, planning commission has just been given to build two houses on it. So, <laughs> obviously somebody's done very well out of it. Um, they're gonna, houses are going to be built on the ground facing our, facing our ground, which will be really interesting when we go our annual, annual Guy Fawkes bonfire. They'll find out why. <laughs> <laughs> where the rockets go. Um, Uh, like uh, all things, the groups continued to improve, and the old field as it was, it was a field. We had it all levelled and reseeded, and it's a lot, obviously a lot easier to maintain, and uh, fewer people to do so. And uh, we've also added modern facilities, like disabled, you know, for that, disabled facilities, um, basketball, basketball courts we've got now, and computer suites, and improved access. So the group continues to develop and uh, grow, fortunately. In 2017, we'll see the group celebrating its centenary. Um, we're well in forward with plans, we have been for a couple of years um, to mark the occasion. Um, I, I picked it up, it's, we're one of the, we will be one of the old, about 40 groups who have reached that, uh, that situation in the country, which I think is quite an achievement. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we, we're going to do our best to uh, mm. really mark the occasion. We, we, I, I wrote to the Chief Scout, you know, um, and asked him if he'd couple of years ago and asked if he put in his diary so he, uh, he could come but uh, to our celebrations and he, he wrote back and said I hope you have a good time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we haven't given up on him. We haven't given up on him and uh, we're now, I now understand we're approaching his agent because of course although he's the chief scout he also, uh, Bear Grylls is a very busy man uh, making television programmes but as well. So uh, we, we're approaching his agent and we're hoping to embarrass him into actually coming along if he can. But um, we're not going to pay him. Um, <laughs> but I, th I think that's a bit sad, actually, <laughs> as a scam. Um, but what, one thing we are doing, and what I think the money generous donation of us to go to, we want to organise quite a big, I was going to say camp, event, really, for the boys during that summer. And uh, we, we've asked them what they'd like to do and that sort of thing. Um, and initially, we thought of going to France on one of these adventure holidays at the schools, start things the schools do. But, in view of the situation that most of the parents have asked us not to do that for security reasons, I suppose. So we're now looking to send the whole group of up to Wales to one of these planned outdoor centres and hopefully we can get, with the money we're getting in, we're having a, we've had a two year work towards raising the money, we're hoping to actually pay for as much as we can, that's giving every boy the opportunity to go, because a lot of them don't go to these sort of things, I can understand the financial pressures on the, on the parents and so forth, so we're hoping to actually be able to finance that to a large extent, if not entirely, <coughs> if, if all that has the opportunity of going along. So that was one of the, one of the objectives. We have a whole range of activities that will be going on um, to celebrate that. Um, just as a matter of interest on a personal note, um, I, I did a bit of digging around amongst my records, and I, I joined the Cubs when I was seven years old, which is uh, something like 65 years ago. Um, I went through the group, Cubs, Scouts, Senior Scouts, Rover Scouts, and when that was disbanded in, I joined the what was a service crew, and I took over as group chairman 27 years ago. So I've been associated with the group for a good few many years, you know, and um, I think that's an honour, um, as far as I'm concerned. It's a bit of service. I'm not good with boys. Some people are naturals. They can. We have scout leaders and cub leaders, our tailors for your benefit, yes. um, who you know who do these things. And they're wonderful. I'm not good with kids. I took them around the ear rather than anything else. So <laughs> I, I tend to keep a little bit of distance from the children. I, I do all the official stuff and you know and badges and shake hands and all that sort of stuff. But um, and of course I, I mainly am involved with the running of the group, servicing the grounds. We maintain the building. Small group of us. Used to be five of us. Three are dead. There's only two left now. <laughs> So we, we persuaded the group to buy us a sit on lawnmower because we, we couldn't walk up there anymore. We don't know. But uh, there's a couple of us, both original, both go back to the cub days and still with the group. And the big worry for me is the continuity when we pack up. What's going to happen? Because um, that sort of tradition doesn't go through anymore. You don't join a group and go through it and you've got a life member almost as we've been. Um, partly because the scout movement's destroying itself quietly, which is very strange to me. but. We have beavers now, so you, you join beavers, I don't know, five I suppose. Horrible little kids there. And they join, and then, then they go into the cubs, for you, and they go into scouts. At that point, they're finished, because no longer are groups allowed to hold any senior. It has to become a district. 
uh, district organised thing, and uh, most of our lads pack it up and they don't want to get involved in it. So they haven't got the association or the mark of the group, but they, want, they like that, that's what they want to be in. They don't want to be in a, some vague district organisation, so most of them leave. Um, we try to get them to stay on as young leaders, but we've noticed, um, I'll be honest, if our groups had existed in 10 years, I'll be very surprised because um, it, the group is it's going to destroy itself, which is sad to me. Mm. When I was in it, you were a Cub Scout, Senior Scout, I think it was Rover. Mm. And the Rovers were the main stays because they, they stayed on as old boys and you know, wore their action shorts and felt good. Um, and they supported the group. They were there if you wanted problems, you would have. Then it was cut off at 20, they had to leave at 26, I think it was. Um, and then eventually they just banded Rovers altogether. Um, now, senior, the senior became ventures, venture units, which we had, and then they've been done away with now, and they've become something else. They're at district level now, they, uh, they don't have anything to do with the groups, which I think is very, very sad because mm. half of what we had was belonging to a group. We were the first up, you know, we were, mm. and we went to anything, we were a group of guys, we stacked together, and we'd knock the nine bells out of the second ups, and they'd knock mm. them, you know, that was part of it, you know, and that, that, that sort of tradition has, uh, has disappeared, and it's disappearing rapidly. Uh, I do worry, uh, I mean, I'm in my 70s, I'm not going to be chairman much longer, and I couldn't tell you who would take over a chairman because there's nobody. The parents don't have any particular interests. Um, if you happen to be standing outside their quarters on a scout night, the, the car will come up, the door will open, the kid will be chucked out, the car will turn around and drive away. Mm -hmm. Two hours later, you could bump the boy again and go away. And you literally, if we want to <coughs> catch the parents, we have to stand in front of them. <laughs> Stop the car, say, you know, can I talk to you? That's what I say. Um, it, and I find that very sad, very sad indeed. Um, but that is the way of modern life, isn't it? The fact that we had to build a computer suite bothered me, so <laughs> that's what the lads want these days, and you've got to provide it. And they get their computer badge, or whatever it's called. Which is, so that's really why, where the money's going, and I thought you'd just like to know why we're making such a big thing of celebrating our 100th, because I don't personally think we'll see another one. And just on a personal note, I got a letter through the post yesterday morning, um, not private and confidential for Scout Movement, which worried me a bit. And it just said it gives me great pleasure to inform you that you've been awarded the Silver Acorn as a mark of the Chief Scout's appreciation for your own special distinguished service for the movement over many years. Well done. Well done. Well done. To get that, I knew nothing about it, but I should be going to Windsor. If I can on um, uh, the day after the band uh, in, in April to. Uh, well, I, I don't receive the award then, but I'm going to go and see the all the scouts being given their Queen Scouts awards and hopefully attend the show service. Yeah. If we can get into that, we're going to book it in. So that was how it finishes for me. And I hope that was interesting. Congratulations. Well, I'd like to say how fascinating both. Talks were. I'm sure Ron actually he's missed his opportunity of buy one get one free. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brian, it was it was very interesting. Both talks were extremely interesting. It's sad to hear this, the the uh, plight of the scout movement. Mm. I've got a question before any of the others ask you questions. Do you get lady scouts? I mean, a bit like Rotary you now have. Yep. Yep, I can't answer. Um, indeed. Um, that is a little bit of my, one of my regrets. Some of the groups are not all scouts, are they? Some are doing very well. Most of the Tatcha churches, and um, there they get that support. Of course, they get the congregation and that sort of thing. So they get a lot more input than we do, being on the committee. But uh, some years ago, girls started joining scouts. Um, not so much cover, they, they, they tend to come in at scout. But, and it has really taken off. And in fact, um, I have an association through my wife who was the secretary of the supporters at um, uh, Semthorn Church Methodist in Upminster, in Horn Church, and their group doubled in size almost through taking girls in. And the girls were undoubtedly far more committed, far more active than the boys. And the boys started leaving. <laughs> no, it's, it's a fact that the girls were, you know, were that good. You know, um, the, the boys. <laughs> so it's a difficult balance to strike, really, and uh, I, I personally don't. I think girls ought to be scouting, but that's you. I was, a, I was a boy scout, anyway. But um, that's an old fashioned, I'm told that's old fashioned. But unfortunately, uh, in a way, I, I, I'm lumbered with a group scout lead, a lovely lady there she is, and she clicked around the issue and said, but she's a lovely lady, about the same age as me, but we've worked together for years. But when I first raised the issue with her and said, could we have a few girls in? She was horror struck. She said, girls in scouting? Wash your mouth out. And uh, that was it. So <laughs> until I get rid of her as group scout, uh, I can't get her. <laughs> but there are a lot, and they're doing very well indeed. Um, 
obviously, I think the guiding movement is particularly upset about it because uh, they're losing an awful lot of the potential. Obviously. But obviously, I don't know, you know, what, what to say about that. But it's working very well. And of course, a lot of our leaders, our own groups, our own scout leaders, are like, you know, so we, in that sense. But uh, well, yeah, there are lots of ladies in scout. Jim. Ryan, your group is um, on sitting on a huge asset. It looking at its own demise, from what you said. Yeah, it's a very interesting point. We've got, we spent hours talking about this, obviously, because uh, the land itself belongs to the group. But as, as an independent group, we really, we really have to run like a small company, because yeah. you know, we have to pay all our own bills. You know, we don't get any help from anybody else. So it, it's, uh, you know, my treasurer who works with me. We sit down and scratch our heads about getting a few more here and there. Um, yes, the big asset is the land, of course. It must be worth an absolute fortune. What will, yeah, who, who, who will those funds go to? Nobody, because um, it's the land. The land is held in trust by four trustees, um, who are, whose responsibility is quite clearly set out in the, in the trust deed. Oh, it's their responsibility to ensure the land remains in the use for scouting or similar activity. It's not right. for some. Um, of course, I guess those trustees could take a you know could take a view. Um, there's only four of us. I'm one of them. Um, I don't know. It, it certainly. I, I, I always thought if it, if we did fold, it would probably we would re, re, re give the land back to the scout movement. That's what I, yeah, and that it would probably go. It would probably go to district level, mm. where mm. I'm sure they could mm. <coughs> capture it. But yeah. that would be an incredibly sad day for me. Yeah. But, um, so so it wouldn't. It wouldn't be sold for profit under any circumstances. Dennis We've been made offered a lot of money for it. Dennis, the other question. <laughs> no, not a question, but an observation. Um, I joined the scouts in 1940. The Six Magnum uh, Scout Troop, and there were at that time, I think, 62 in our troop, which is quite a big, big outfit. And I would think I, I came out in 1948 when I went into the services. In the meantime, having got kicked out of the air cadets, um, being underage, but as far as I was concerned. The scout was the thing that I looked to uh, forward to our meetings on a Friday night. Was, you couldn't get there quick enough, really. And uh, I think everyone that was in that troop and in other scout troops benefited from being in the scouts because they learned so many different things. Because there were so many different sections, don't they, Brian, to take their cooking, the cooking and various other things. And it's a great shame now that you don't, at one stage, you, you wore your scout uniform with pride. You went out, but now you don't see a you don't see a, a boy in a scout uniform or a boys' brigade uniform, which was also a, you know another great good thing for you. But I think it's just sad now that uh, that these things seem to have grinding to a gradual halt. Well, you certainly see boys in uniform. I mean, they, they do wear all our lads wear uniforms. <coughs> they. Uh, Slightly look more casual than it used to be. I don't really approve, but uh, they they don't wear hats anymore and that sort of thing, which I think is wrong. But obviously that's the modern trend, isn't it? I mean, that's the modern uh, relaxation, which comes. I don't think you can say that's wrong. It's just the way it is. But certainly they do wear a uniform. They look they look quite smart when we say when they get them out for the George's parade, that sort of thing. You know, they polish their shoes. They don't. They look all that. I think. Um, this is scared as it looks scruffy. They look good, but <laughs> that's <laughs> they would. Do they do they ever appear in the um, Lord Bears show? Yes, the yes. Yeah. 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 they do. I seen them a long time, but you will always see the scouts if you watch the Commemorance Days parade in, in London when they do the Lane of the Reason. Yeah. Always, is it always scouts lined up where they come out of the uh, ministry? And they walk out to the cenotaph. There's a lot of scouts on either side. Queen scouts. They've always done that. And they are always there, uh, uh, girls and boys. Well, I, I looked last year. Um, they always do that every year. And there's lots of things they do do. They don't do Bob a job anymore, do we? And that's a, that thing when you know, as a boy, used to go around. Would you? Would they allow to do it now? Of course they wouldn't. And that's that's half the battle. A lot of things that you and I played British bulldogs or whatever we did, they're not allowed to do now. And the, the whole problem is that everybody looks so close here. You know, if you sort of fire lighting, oh, blimey, you can't. using an axe, they throw their hands up in horror. All this sort of thing. Um, Give you an example. We we, we we got into awful tr <laughs> trouble with one of our uh, parents who was on the executive committee, and uh, we used to have games where the lads apparently ran up down the hall, timed up, ran back, and all this sort of stuff. Such so on in teams, and his son fell over. We used to do some blogs things. We used. His son fell over and hurt himself something, and he made an informed complaint to the group and said he was unhappy. He thought it was an unsafe practice. 
um, and he asked to see the risk assessment for the game, which caused a bit of consternation. <laughs> but um, in the end, uh, I said to him, well, look, okay, you, you tell us you know, what you think would be safe, you know, a chair, what would you like to see? And he went away and he produced a, a risk assessment, that, that thing. And at the end of that, I said to him, well, what, what, what's, your, what's your answer? What, what do we do? You know? And he suggested we use a cone. Traffic cone, which okay, so we we got the traffic cones. The two boys fell over and hurt themselves because these <laughs> cones weren't stable. They just so yeah. I said to him, what what, what was <laughs> but that? Just as an example is how it goes. You know, the parents are, are on your back all the time. Uh, when we used to go camping, as I'm sure you do, you know, you put it in a track cart and double off to wherever you're going. Can't can't do anything like that now, of course. It has to be transported and all that sort of thing. But. Um, well, I was I, when, when, the, when they go camping, there's always a home representative, and I'm, I generally get done with that job. So you're a contact if there's a problem, they ring you, and you do all the, the paperwork. And uh, I was talking to the scout leader, she had it all laid out at the table, and I just went to camp, she was giving me the papers I needed. And there was this huge chart. I said, What's all that about then? Some activity. She says, No, that's. That's all the boys, and that's all their tablets and pills and all the things. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to make sure every day, she said, I have to go down the line, and see daddy's tablet, and see daddy's whatsoever. She said, and if I don't do any, if I don't do it, the parents will be on my back and I'll be in terrible trouble. Because, you know, yes. so she, <laughs> said, no, she's more worried about these, you know, they take these pills and so on. And it, it took, takes a bit of fat out of it, really, to buy, you know. So, yeah, that doesn't, this is a good business, but a cotton wool, <laughs> just as one final comment, just Japan has gone for rest, that's good. But the other reason I was going to link the two together was, of course, that last year the Jamboree, the World Jamboree for Scouting, was held in Japan. And it was a huge success, apparently. And uh, a number of our senior boys went, and I went to the district um, AGM some weeks ago, and they gave a talk about it, which was fascinating me, what they thought about Japan and how they, you know, all these different scouts. But one of the things they did when well, they were there, they had to go, they were asked to go and live for a couple of days with a family of Japanese people. They'd take them in, they become part of the family. And they, they, they were a bit apprehensive, but and the lad, well, the lads said, yeah, he was, he was a bit worried. They come and collected and took him home, you know. First night was all right. We got, well, they gave me five courses to eat for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was a bit taken aback. He said, if you know what to do. So, you know, just little reactions to things like that. But uh, the Jamboree was a huge success in Japan. The children loved it. And certainly, though, half dozen went from this district thought it was wonderful. So, yeah, it's all around us still scouting. Very active. Well, I'd like to thank Brian once again, and I'm sure you all would, for uh, two very, very instructive yeah. I think he's demonstrated in these two talks the difference between East and West, and probably then and now. And uh, there are still obviously differences because some countries the wearing of uniform has become taboo. I mean, even our the military soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines are told not to leave barracks in their uniforms. Um, in, in the East, they wear their uniforms with pride, whether it be scouts or military, ambulance men, they're very, very happy. So, uh, yeah, time to change. Anyway, once again, thanks a lot, Brian. It was very good. I will ask you please to be upstanding for the final toast.